Right, so for, for those who haven't been to one of these seminars before, my name is Chris Kiel, I'm a postdoc in the, in the faculty, and we've been running these sort of seminars in the Student Society here for the last two and a half years now, roughly. This year the, the lectures are going to be quite interactive, well that's kind of the, the, the aim, and there's going to be a discussion session at the end. So I'm going to talk for about 30, 40 minutes, and then time to really talk about things with each other, because when doing ethics it's not sort of an individualistic pursuit. You have to do it with other people. Something I mentioned last lecture, and I'll, I'll remind everyone again, is, and this is what you get taught in the first lecture if you go to Oxford and do the Politics, Philosophy and Economics course, which is, ask a question in response to Every question. <laughs> Don't ever take anything I give you at face value, or anything anything else gives you at face value. So what is what you said just mean? <laughs> <laughs> I like the thinking. What it means is that if I ask you something, there might be more information and more perspective that you need before you're happy to answer it. Ask for that, because in mathematics we teach you to take a set of situation, rules, boundary conditions, whatever, and work exclusively with that. But just because we don't tell you something doesn't mean it's not there to be asked for that. So please ask questions in response to my questions to you. So today's lecture is finance and, and modeling. So I'll start by giving three examples of mathematicians, mathematically trained people, who decided to, 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 to venture into the world of finance and ended up not all too good for it at the end of the process. The first of these is a gentleman by, by the name of Tom Hayes. Tom had a math and engineering degree from the University of was it Manchester now? Nottingham. Nottingham, sorry, Nottingham of course. He went to do to work in finance. And he was involved in the reading of LIBOR. LIBOR stands for the London Interbank Offered Rate. Basically, every day at 11 o'clock, all the banks in London get together and they say, right, what would it cost us to borrow money today in US dollars for three months? And there are various numbers. I mean, there was the yen amount and the euro amount, and it was three months, six months, 12 months. But the, standard, the most common one, I think, was LIBOR US dollar three months or six months. And so the banks would put in their, their, their estimates, and then it's kind of like figure skating. The, of the, of the uh, 16 banks, the top four and bottom four were removed, and the middle eight were averaged. And this was the LIBOR rate for that day. Again, there was a set of them for various providers. Can you remind me what LIBOR is an acronym for? London Interbank Offered Rate. Offered Rate. Offered Rate, yes. Thank you. Because it's an offer. So this, this gave an interest rate, pretty important interest rate. This interest rate is used to price almost every financial product you can imagine around the world. Your student loan interest rate is priced based off LIBOR. Your home loan interest rate is priced based off LIBOR. Your car loan interest rate priced based off LIBOR. And it's not just in the UK, it's global. The whole world is using this one interest rate to decide how much interest to charge on various things. So what do you think happened? Bankers are using these interest rates too. But the bankers are also setting the interest rate. So they read it. Plain and simple. They systematically read LIBOR. They read it in two ways. Firstly, they read it to favor their own trading positions because they have various contracts that you can set up, and if LIBOR went up or down, your contract would work more or less, depending on which way it was structured. Then towards the crash of 2007, they started reading it to make themselves look good. Because if I go to the table and say, yes, if I was to borrow US dollars, I'd expect to pay 4%, and my competitor says, well, I don't expect to pay 3%, then you're giving information about yourself. You're telling someone that you don't think you're as safe a borrower as the person next to you. So they then rigged it down to give the image that they would 
really safe, a safe pair of hands to put, to put money into. Now this all came to life in 2011. And only one person so far has gone to jail for it. That's Tom Hayes. Tom systematically rigged LIBOR when he was part of Citigroup. And he did it in a pretty brazen way. He would call up traders and admins, you know, offer bribes basically. So you call up other banks and say, hey, can you push LIBOR up or down a tiny bit? Now, have to remember that LIBOR was very stable. It was sort of even, 3.2%. Plus or minus, you know, point one of a percent over over you know, many week, many month period. So moving at point oh one of a percent or point oh oh one was just enough to get yourself a bit of an edge. So Tom paid out over three hundred thousand pounds in bribes over a five to ten year period. Not exactly clear when it started. Then he was eventually caught. Now, of course, other people were doing this too, but he was the poor scapegoat. He was... The trial is quite complicated because he was first uh, put under extra charge to go to the US. And he decided he didn't want to be pro prosecuted in the US. So he tried to make it as though he should be prosecuted in the UK. So he gave the prosecutors lots of hours of interview of evidence, 86 hours of interview evidence against him to stop, to make UK charges appear. And then, the US says, well, we can't actually because the UK will. But then he decided he didn't want to actually plead guilty after all that. So he pled innocent after providing 86 hours of tape, reported interview evidence against himself. And was sentenced to 14 years jail. He appealed, and did win the appeal, got it down to 11. Tom is just mathematician engineer, like most of you in this room, went off to finance, was doing what was generally accepted as the done thing in the industry, did it well in the Chaucerian sense, that you can be a good thief, mm -hmm. as in efficient your profession doesn't mean you're a good person, <clears throat> and went to jail. Quite a long time. His son was, I think, two years older in the jail, would be 13 when he gets out. Tom was manipulated. Tom was malleable. Didn't have extraordinarily good social perspective. He didn't have the ability to see what other people were doing around him and how they were impacting him. And so for the high level bankers, he was easy fodder. Tom was later diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. It's quite strange because his wife was a psychologist. And for 10 years, she never realized her husband had Asperger's. If you Read about following a bit more, you see that actually it was perhaps fairly obvious. But he didn't have the ability to gauge if people were trying to manipulate him. He ended up going to jail for every decade because of it. So, that was our first example. Um, Second is, before you move on, um, that's his story, but given the people he was involved with, uh, some of whom were also crooks, by the nature of his operations. Did any of those get picked up by now, some others got picked up but because they hadn't provided eighty six hours of recorded evidence against themselves, they didn't go to jail. Tom oh. wasn't very clever in the sense of what he was doing. I'll finish these, these two examples before taking any questions. So next was Ki Tsu. I think I pronounced correctly. He was a mathematician here in Cambridge. He was a Trinity. He finished part two in 2007. He came top of 1D in Trinity in, 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 in 2006, got a medal or something for it. Very clever. Then went to work for Goldman Sachs, and then Trenchant Limited, a company which provides algorithmic trading software. One day, he decided he didn't get a big enough bonus from his employer. So the recourse he took was to reverse engineer some of the code, copy it onto a disk, and fly to Hong Kong. The thing is, you shouldn't mess with really, really, really powerful and wealthy institutions. The minute he got off the plane, he literally like downloaded the, the, the stuff, grabbed the disk, went to the airport. In the time it took to fly to Hong Kong, an extradition request had already been sent. 
He got off the plane, handcuffed, straight back on the plane. And back to the UK, was jailed for five years? I think still hasn't been released. He's about to be released. Now, mathematically, is very clever. Perhaps it wasn't the wisest idea to, to try and lift all the code and software from your employer. He felt aggrieved, thought he deserved a million dollar bonus, and he got 400,000. His response was that. That was his solution to the problem. Not sure exactly. They have various monitoring systems. It may be something as stupid as, you know, where did he go? Why is he on the plane? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> yeah. If I remember correctly, that was he wanted. He expected a million, and he got four hundred thousand. <coughs> Last half. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the numbers that we're talking about here. I mean, we laugh. It's like you got four hundred thousand, dude. Shut up. But once you get ingrained in this culture, and we'll talk more about this later. It's like I'll talk more about being exploited by your employer later in later lectures. Once you get ingrained in a certain culture and a certain way of life. $400,000 actually seems like a small amount of money. It does it now, yeah, your, your £2.70 meal at college seems like a large amount of money. <laughs> but, 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 but later on, £2.70 won't seem like a large amount of money. Or how $400,000 will not seem like a large amount of money. Your perspective changes as you move to a different place. So actually, the... Um, he was going to be deported back to China, and the company blocked the deportation, said, no, keep in the UK, because he still has those trade secrets. And they said, you know, these trade secrets will still be valid until the end of 2018. So there's some strange court case going on where the UK wants to deport him, but his previous employer said, no, don't, because we'll go to China and give everyone our trade secrets. So it's really strange, strange scenario. But, he thought he was being tricksy and clever and ended up doing five years for it. Third, flash crash in 2010, who's heard of it? 9% dip in the US stock market over a period of 36 minutes. 9% to the US stock market is approximately $1 trillion. Oop. What's believed to have happened? Gentleman by, gentleman by the name of Navita Sarau, I can't pronounce it correctly, you can edit this properly, used some spoofing algorithms to do some trading. So what does that mean? Well, you have your market. A market is a collection of sort of buy offers and sell offers. There's a sort of buy graph here. So these are people selling, so these are people wanting to buy stuff. This is, this is, uh, price, uh, no, this is not even, this is price. So if people want to sell stuff up to, say, $70. Sorry, want to buy up to $70. So these are your buyers. These are your sellers. So some people might want to buy at 70, some will buy at 68, 66, and so on. And your sellers, some will sell at 72, some will sell at 74, and, and, and so on. So what happens is, when a buyer sort of moves into this zone, he swallows up a sell, or when a seller moves into this zone, he swallows up a buy. Okay, let's go to the market. So what the vendor did, in a really clever, automated way, he spoofed the market. He put lots and lots and lots and lots, I think it was, was it buy orders or sell orders? Actually, I think it was sell orders. No, it was buy orders. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of orders on the market, just below the top price. And people thought, oh, we can, we can, we'll start to, to buy because look at all these, all these orders that are here, just, just below the, the current price. We know that if we do a massive sell-off, we won't move the market price much. Because if you try and sell all your stuff, you do move the price down. That's how market works. So you put them there, but in a really clever way, that as soon as this sort of went away, 
He cancelled his, his um, buy order and put one next to it, a little bit below. And then as soon as whoever else at the port, Saps, who we're trying to sell here, got done, he cancelled this and put one next to it. So he chased, the market was chased down. It's completely automated way. Now actually in his, his criminal defense case, he claimed that he was just clicking his mouse really quickly and changing his mind and went for advice. Like, you're an idiot. I was gonna believe you. That's that's what he claimed he was doing. He decided he wanted to sell for two cents less three milliseconds later. And so clicked to, to, to make the change. Obviously not. No, he, he, he actually worked with a, another software developer to, to, to do that. So you keep doing this enough. And what happens? You chase all the prices down. He made some money. It's actually really funny. He made, I, mean, I think he ended up with something like 50 million in his pocket after, after doing this, and other trades as well. So he caused a temporary 10 to 9% dip, trillion dollars, went away, came back again. But still, you don't want 10% movement in a stock market that sort of moves about 10 to 10% a day. He knew that was going to happen, so, so he, he traded the other way. <laughs> so he did get caught, and they tried to recover the money. Now, mathematically, this guy was pretty clever. But in terms of actual genuine investment strategy of where to put $50 million, he was a sucker. He invested his money in some dodgy magic beans, Jack and the Beanstalk type investment scheme, and literally lost it all to used car salesmen, or slick, slick, slick sellers. So again, mathematically, pretty clever. In terms of understanding direction of people and where to actually invest money, not so clever. Uh, he's been found. No, it's just, he, 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 he was. He, he pleaded guilty, and he's yet to be sentenced. These are my three examples of people who <laughs> did some math in a not too clever, not too careful way, and have gone to jail, or will go to jail for it. And the repeating themes, firstly, it takes a long time for the law to realize and respond in these situations. Tom Hayes' trial took something like four years in total, five years. Um, this, I mean, this, this has taken several years as well. We'll catch you. But they're a bit slow to move and a bit slow to regulate. LIBOR is now considered to be something that's totally useless. It's totally flawed, we shouldn't be using LIBOR anymore. Because only after a long investigation, and LIBOR is being phased out, I think by the end of 2020 or something like this. Considering that the rigging happened in 2000 and up to 2006, 2007, and you don't have the phase out in 2020, that's a very slow reaction time. So regulators aren't too quick off the mark. We can move much faster to that conditions. But if we do dodgy stuff, we will get caught and go to jail. Second repeating theme is that smart people can do some seriously stupid stuff. Mathematically, all these people are great. As I said, uh, he who came top infinity, 1B. <laughs> Tom was often called the smartest guy in the room, and the vendor, well, implemented a really, really clever algorithm. Incredibly legal, still very clever. But when it comes to actually figuring out you know, societal impact, what's going to happen, reading people, or even where should I put my $50 million, it's not so good. Lack of perspective. Good question. Yeah, what was it? He actually did that was illegal. Uh, fraudulently putting up transactions on the on, on the market. He, it, it's Fraud, called fraudulently in what sense? But he did not with, have, with, with the intent to manipulate the market. But isn't that what always happens? No, I mean, if I have you know a hundred shares in 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 BP and put them on the market, the market moves a little bit. But I'm in goodwill selling my shares. If I'm doing massive sell orders and then canceling them after six milliseconds and then moving them down two cents and putting them up and canceling them six milliseconds. I'm not a genuine seller. I'm actually, and it's quite obvious, I'm trying to live in the market. Yeah, but I mean, is it that he did not have...
had the things he was proposing to sell. <laughs> it knows that he was trading them in a way that manipulates the, the, the price. Yeah, you can't do that. This is when uh, Tesco offers cheap prices at the weekend. <laughs> They're manipulating the market. Right? There's a million in the share market. I mean, you know how to do this. Yeah, yeah, the actual. I'm talking about the share market. I'm talking about the market in general. Yeah, well, this, this is specific to the share market. So there are certain rules. Yes, there are certain rules that you the things you can and can't do in the share market. Right. And one of them is what he was doing here. Okay. Yeah, there are laws against this. And in later lectures, we'll start talking about law and interpretation of the law and how it affects us as mathematicians. But for now, I just want to go through and sort of show you what the, the case studies of what, what's happening. <coughs> 